Hello and welcome back to another spine-chilling episode where we dive into the darkest corners of true crime history. I'm your host, Larry Elise. Today we uncover a case so gruesome it shocked an entire nation and still haunts annals of criminal lore. Imagine, if you will, a quiet Houston neighborhood in the sweltering summer of 1965. The kind of place where everyone knows each other and nothing out of the ordinary ever seems to happen. But behind the doors of a seemingly normal home at 1815 Driscoll Street, a horror beyond imagination was about to be discovered. It all began with a routine call to the police, a missing persons report that led officers to this unassuming house. What they found inside would forever change their lives and the community around them. The mystery centers around a reclusive sun, an eerie silence, and a home filled with unsettling secrets. As we piece together the fragments of this chilling puzzle, we'll explore the dark secrets hidden within the walls of the Rogers home and the enigmatic figure at the heart of the investigation. Join me as we delve deep into the shadows of this case, uncovering the twisted mind behind one of the most notorious unsolved murders in American history. This is the tale of the Icebox Murders, and it's a journey you won't soon forget. The Icebox Murders, one of Houston's most gruesome and perplexing mysteries, have captivated the public's imagination for decades. So let's dive deep into the details of what exactly happened. On June 23, 1965, the Houston police made a chilling discovery that would haunt the community for years to come. The scene was an ordinary looking house in a quiet neighborhood, but what they found inside was anything but ordinary. In the kitchen, authorities discovered two large refrigerators. Inside those refrigerators, the dismembered bodies of Fred and Ed Edwina Rogers, an elderly couple who had been reported missing. The discovery began when concerned relatives and neighbors who hadn't heard from Fred and Edwina for several days requested a welfare check. When the police arrived, they were met with an eerie silence. The officers entered the home and quickly noticed a foul odor emanating from the kitchen. Upon opening the refrigerators, they were horrified to find various body parts neatly wrapped in butcher paper with no sign of the couple's heads or organs. The dismemberment of the bodies was both meticulous and brutal. The killer had expertly disarticulated the bodies at the joints, separating them into manageable pieces. These pieces were then carefully wrapped and stored in the refrigerators. It was a scene straight out of a horror movie, with the heads and internal organs conspicuously missing, possibly disposed of elsewhere. The precision suggested that the perpetrator might have some anatomical knowledge or experience in butchery. Leading up to the grisly discovery, Fred and Edwin Rogers were last seen alive on June 20th, 1965. The elderly couple lived with their reclusive son, Charles Rogers, who was known for his strange and secretive behavior. Neighbors and relatives became suspicious when days passed without any communication from the couple. Their suspicions grew when Charles was nowhere to be found adding another layer of mystery to the case. And now we're going to take a look at some of the key dates and milestones in the investigation. June 20th, 1965, the couple were last seen alive, and then three days later, the police discovered the dismembered bodies, and then the very next day, a nationwide manhunt was launched for Charles Rogers. And from 1965 to 1966, despite extensive efforts, Charles Rogers remained a elusive, and no significant leads were found. And then 1967, the case grew cold, as all attempts to locate Charles failed. Then in the 80s, renewed interest in the case led to several theories about Charles' possible whereabouts and involvement. And then, more recently, in 2003, a book titled The Man on the Grassy Knoll suggests Charles Rogers was involved in the Kennedy assassination, further complicating the case. And, as of today... The Icebox murders remain unsolved, with Charles Rogers still missing and presumed dead. The Icebox murders continue to baffle investigators and captivate true crime enthusiasts. So who were the victims? To understand the gravity of the Icebox murders, it's essential to know more about the victims, Fred and Edwina Rogers. 
their lives before the crime, and their relationships may hold vital clues to this unsolved mystery. Fred and Edwina Rogers were an elderly couple living in a modest home in Houston, Texas. Fred was born on March 19, 1884, and was 81 at the time of his death. He worked as a real estate broker, though in his later years he was eventually retired. His wife, born on October 8, 1892, was 72 years old and spent much of her life as a homemaker, dedicated to maintaining their household and supporting her family. When it, <clears throat> excuse me. They were both known to their neighbors as a quiet and unassuming couple. They led a relatively private life, seldom engaging in community activities or social events. Despite their reclusive nature, those who knew them described them as polite and friendly when encountered. Before the horrific events of June 1965, the couple's lives were marked by a sense of routine and normalcy. They had lived in their home for many years, raising their only son, Charles Rogers. Their household was typical of the era, with Fred handling financial matters and his wife taking care of domestic duties. However, there were underlying tensions within the family. Their son, Charles, had a history of erratic behavior and had become increasingly reclusive over the years. He was a highly intelligent individual having served as a pilot in the U.S. Navy and later worked as a geophysicist. Despite his professional achievements, Charles' relationship with his parents was strained, and he reportedly had little communication with them, even though they lived under the same roof. The most intriguing and unsettling aspect of the Icebox murders is the relationship between the victims and the suspected perpetrator. Charles, the couple's son, is the primary suspect in their murders. Charles' interactions with his parents were minimal and often contentious. He lived in the attic of their home, rarely seen by neighbors or family members. At the time of the murders, he was 43. Um, he was a strange son and lived with them, but maintained little contact. Charles's peculiar behavior and his sudden disappearance following the discovery of his parents' body have led many to believe he was involved in the crime. Despite extensive searches and investigations, Charles was never found and his motivations are still a mystery. Why are these murders considered so gruesome? Well, just to warn you, the fo this following segment contains graphic descriptions of a crime scene that some viewers and listeners may find disturbing, so viewer discretion is advised. The Icebox murders are considered one of the most gruesome crimes in his Houston's history due to the horrific state in which the victim's bodies were discovered. When the police entered the Rogers' home on June 23, 1965, like we previously mentioned, they were met with a scene straight out of a nightmare. The pungent odor of decay filled the air, leading the officers to the kitchen, where they made their grisly discovery. The bodies of the couple had been meticulously dismembered. The killer had exactly separated the bodies at the joints, disarticulating the limbs from the torso. Each body part was then carefully wrapped in butcher paper and placed in the refrigerator. The level of precision suggested that the perpetrator had some anatomical knowledge or experience possibly in butchery or surgery. Notably, the heads and internal organs were missing from the scene, adding an even more macabre element to the crime. The conditions in which the bodies were found added to the gruesomeness of the crime. The neatly wrapped body parts stored alongside everyday food items in the refrigerator suggested a chilling level of calculation and cold-bloodedness. It was as if the killer had turned the kitchen into a makeshift morgue. The discovery of the bodies in the state was shocking, not only because of the violence involved, but also because of the sheer audacity and callousness displayed by the perpetrator. To put the box, uh, icebox murders into perspective, let's compare them to other infamous crimes known for their brutality. So, starting off from 1947, you have the Black Dahlia murder. Elizabeth Short's body was found bisected at the waist with a level of precision that also su suggested surgical skill. Like the Icebox murders, the case involved a high degree of dismemberment and remains unsolved to this day. Of course, most famously of all, you have the Jack the Ripper murders from 1888 in Victorian London. Victims were often found with their bodies mutilated, including the removal of organs. Killer's knowledge of human anatomy in these cases has led to similar speculation about the identity and profession of the Icebox, Icebox Murders perpetrator. And of course, from 1991, you have the Jeffrey Dahmer case. Dahmer, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal, stored body parts of his victims in his apartment, including his refrigerator. The 
The cold and calculated nature of Dahmer's actions echoes the chilling detail of how the Rogers bodies were stored. These comparisons highlighted the particularly brutal nature of the Icebox murders. The combination of meticulous dismemberment, the use of the family refrigerator for storage, and the disappearance of key body parts makes this crime stand out as exceptionally heinous. And now we're going to talk a little more into the discovery of the crime scene. The discovery of the Icebox murders crime scene was a pivotal moment that would haunt the memory of those involved for years to come. So let's take a look at how the authorities stumbled upon the gruesome scene and their immediate reactions. On June 23rd, which, like we previously mentioned, concerns neighbors and relatives requested a welfare check on the couple. They had not heard from them for several days, and their reclusive son, Charles, was nowhere to be seen. Responding to the call, Houston police entered the Rogers' home, finding the home eerily quiet with no signs of disturbance, but noticed a foul odor leading them to the kitchen. As the officers made their way into the kitchen, they were struck by an overwhelming stench. It was clear that something was terribly wrong. They opened the refrigerator and met with a sight that would forever be etched in their minds. The dismembered body parts of Fred and Edwin uh, Rogers, wrapped in butcher paper and neatly stacked inside. The initial response was one of shock and disbelief. The officers immediately realized they were dealing with a horrific crime. They called for backup and secured the scene to preserve any potential evidence. The gruesome nature of the discovery necessitated a careful and methodical approach to avoid contaminating the crime scene. Securing the crime scene was a top priority. The officers cordoned off the house, restricting access to essential personnel only. Forensic experts and homicide detectives were called in to examine the scene in detail. The entire area was treated as a potential goldmine of evidence, with every inch scrutinized for clues. To ensure the integrity of the investigation, the authorities also began canvassing the neighborhood, speaking with neighbors and potential witnesses. They needed to gather as much information as possible about the days leading up to the discovery, including any unusual activity or sightings. The first impressions of law enforcement and emergency responders were a mix of horror and determination. The sheer brutality of the dismemberment and the methodical nature of the storage suggested a level of premeditation that was deeply unsettling. Officers on the scene were reportedly shaken by the sight. Many had never encountered such a grisly crime in their careers. The detectives knew that they were facing a daunting task. Solving a murder case with such bizarre elements was going to be incredibly challenging. Emergency responders tasked with handling the bodies and transporting them for an autopsy were also deeply affected. The careful wrapping and refrigeration of the body parts added a layer of cold calculation that was hard to comprehend. Excuse me. The Icebox Murders case is shrouded in mystery, and the evidence found at the crime scene play, has played a crucial role in both advancing and stalling the investigation. Take a look at the key pieces of evidence discovered, the forensic findings, and the challenges investigators faced. The crime scene at the Rogers home yielded several critical pieces of evidence. The dismembered bodies of Fred and Edwin Rogers, meticulously wrapped in butcher paper, and stored in the refrigerator were the most immediate and shocking evidence. Additionally, the absence of the victims' heads and internal organs su suggested a deliberate attempt to obscure the identities and cause of death. The bodies, the dismembered and neatly wrapped body parts, were the primary evidence. The killer's meticulous handling of the remains indicated a high level of anatomical knowledge or experience in butchery. And then the blood stains. Blood was found in various areas of the house, particularly in the bathroom indicating that the dismemberment likely occurred there. Several household, household items, including knives and tools, were collected as potential murder weapons. Forensic evidence played a vital role in homicide investigations, and the icebox murders were no exception. However, the state of forensic science in 1965 poised significant limitations. At the time, DNA analysis was not available. Modern re-examination of the evidence could potentially yield new insights if biological samples were preserved. And just like fingerprints, uh, or just like DNA, fingerprints analysis was conducted on the crime scene and household items. However, no conclusive ma matches were found that could directly link any suspect to the crime. 
and uh, blood stains were found in the bathroom and other areas of the house and were analyzed to confirm they belonged to the victims. This analysis helped piece together the sequence of events during the murders. And then we have some physical evidence that was collected from the crime scene, including potential murder weapons and other items that could have been used during the crime. Like we mentioned, several knives and tools from the household were taken into evidence. These items were analyzed for traces of blood and tissue, though no definitive murder weapon was ever identified. Items belonging to Fred and Charles, um, Fred, Edwina, and Charles Rogers were cataloged. While these did not provide direct evidence of the crime, they helped establish a timeline and potential motives. Now, however, there were some challenges in collecting and preserving that evidence. Investigators faced numerous challenges and preserving or faced numerous challenges in collecting and preserving evidence which have complicated the case over the years. Starting off with uh, crime scene contamination. Given the shocking nature of the discovery, the initial response may have inadvertently led to some contamination of the crime scene. The forensic technology available in 1965 was rudimentary compared to today's standards. This limitation hindered the ability to conduct thorough analysis. And some crucial evidence, such as the victim's heads and organs, was never recovered. Their missing evidence has left significant gaps in the investigation. Forensic experts analyzed the available evidence, but their findings were limited by the technology and methodologies at the time. Experts concluded that the precision of the dismemberment suggested a perpetrator with significant anatomical knowledge. This finding pointed to the possibility of the killer having a medical or butchery background. Behavioral experts provided profiles of the potential perpetrator, suggesting that the crime was premeditated and carried out by someone with a close relationship to the victims, most likely their son, Charles. Despite the efforts of forensic experts, the evidence collected has not been sufficient to solve the case definitively. The challenges in the evidence collection and the limitation of the time have left many questions unanswered. Now we're going to take a look at the primary suspects. The Icebox Murders case has intrigued investigators and true crime enthusiasts alike, primarily due to the elusive nature of its primary suspect. So let's dive into the initial suspects identified by the police, their backgrounds, and why they were considered suspects. From the onset, Charles Frederick Rogers, the son of the victim, was the primary, primary suspect in the case. Despite living in the same house, Charles was conspicuously absent when the bodies were discovered, and his sudden disappearance only heightened suspicions. So, like we previously mentioned, uh, he was 43 at the time of the murders, a former Navy pilot and geophysicist, a highly intelligent individual with a degree in nuclear phys physics from H University of Houston. He was described as reclusive and secretive, and really rarely interacted with neighbors or family members, leading an almost hermit-like existence in his parents' home. Excuse me. So, why was he considered a suspect? Well, to start off with, he vanished shortly after the discovery of his parents' bodies. His disappearance, coupled with the lack of any signs of forced entry or struggle in the house, pointed to someone familiar with the victims and their routine. And of course, despite living in the same house, Charles maintained minimal contact with his parents. His reclusive behavior in the hidden attic space where he stayed added to the suspicion. Investigators found that Charles had constructed a secret exit from his attic room, allowing him to come and go without being noticed. And three, the precision of the dismemberment suggested that the perpetrator had significant anatomical knowledge. Charles' background as a geophysicist in his earlier stint in the Navy, where he might have acquired such skills, made him a likely candidate. And, of course, there's, like most cases, a financial motive. There were rumors of financial disputes between Charles and his parents. It was believed that Charles had grown increasingly frustrated with his parents, which could have provided a motive for the murders. Despite the clear suspicion cast upon Charles Rogers, there were no notable interactions or interviews with him following the discovery of the crime. His sudden disappearance thwarted any immediate efforts to question him about the murders. Despite being the primary suspect, Charles Rogers remained a fugitive, and his whereabouts are still unknown. The lack of direct interaction with him has left many questions unanswered and has perpetuated the mystery surrounding the Icebox murders. 
And now, before we move on, we'd like to mention our affiliate of the week, and that is Hulu. I just made the best decision for my entertainment needs, switching to Hulu plus live TV. Let me tell you why you should too. With Hulu plus live TV, I get everything I love in one place. I can stream all my favorite TV shows and movies on demand, and I never miss out on live sports, breaking news, or my favorite TV channels. It's like having the best of both worlds. Whether I'm in the mood for a movie night, catching up on the latest episode of my favorite series, or cheering my team on during the big game, Hulu plus Live TV has me covered. And the best part? No more juggling multiple subscriptions or missing out on what's happening live. Plus, I can watch on any device, anytime, anywhere. It's super convenient and fits perfectly into my busy lifestyle. So what are you waiting for? Join me and make the switch to Hulu plus Live TV today. Trust me, you won't regret it. Sign up now and experience the best in streaming and live TV all in, all in one place. And the best part is, the link is in my description. You can click it and check it out today. And with that, let's go back to our episode. The Icebox murders have spawned numerous theories and speculations over the years, each attempting to unravel the mystery behind this gruesome crime. So let's dive into some of the most popular theories about the identity and motive of the perpetrator, analyze their plausibility, and explore opinions and some more unconventional ideas. Starting off with, and the most popular, I guess, would be Charles Rogers as the sole perpetrator. The most widely accepted theories is that Charles Rogers, the son of the victims, was the sole perpetrator of the murders. His son's disappearance and evidence suggested his intimate knowledge of the crime scene makes this the leading theory. The motive, financial disputes and long-standing familial tensions. The means, Charles' background in geophysics and his possible anatomical knowledge suggest he had the skills necessary for the precise dismemberment of the bodies. His opportunity, living in the same house, provided him with the access needed to commit the crime without arousing immediate suspicion. Number two, Charles Rogers was assisted by an accomplice. Another theory posits that Charles did not act alone. Given the meticulous nature of the dismemberment and the effort required to conceal the bodies, some believe he may have had help. Motive? Similar financial disputes or personal vendettas shared by the accomplice. Means? The accomplice could have had specialized skills or knowledge that complemented Charles' ability. Opportunity, the accomplice would have to be someone close to the Rogers family or someone Charles trusted implicitly. And number three, Charles, is, uh, Charles Rogers was framed. A less conventional theory suggests that Charles Rogers was framed for the murders. This theory hinges on the idea that someone else had a motive to eliminate Fred and his wife and found Charles' reclusive behavior a convenient cover. Motive, the true perpetrator may have had a grudge against the family or a desire to inherit or control their assets. Means, the framing could have been orchestrated by planting evidence or creating circumstances that would naturally point to Charles. Opportunity, the real perpetrator would have needed access to the house and a deep understanding of the fam family dynamics to successfully frame Charles. So we're going to take a look at each of the theories actual plausibility. Starting off with Charles Rogers as the sole perpetrator, there's a high possibility that this is true. This theory aligns with the available evidence and Charles' suspicious disappearance. His strained relationship with his parents and his expertise make this theory the most credible. Uh, number two, he had an accomplice. This was more of a moderate plausibility. While possible, there's no direct evidence of an accomplice. The meticulous nature of the crime does suggest that a second person could have been involved. But this remains speculative. And of course, three, Charles Rogers was framed. Now this is pretty low plausibility. There's not, a, not really any strong evidence to support this theory. The complexity of framing someone, someone so convincingly would require a highly sophisticated perpetrator, which seems less likely given the context. Experts in criminal psychology and forensic analysis tend to support the theory that Charles Rogers was the perpetrator. His disappearance and the nature of the crime strongly suggest premeditation and personal involvement. Experts also highlight the psychological profile of Charles as someone capable of committing such an act 
due to his reclusive and secretive behavior. Forensic experts emphasize the anatomical precision required for the dismemberment, pointing towards someone with a certain level of expertise, which Charles might have possessed given his scientific background. So now we're going to take a look at some conspiracy theories or in less conventional ideas, starting off with a JFK assassination connection. One of the more wild and outlandish conspiracy theories links Charles Rogers to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This theory suggests that Charles was involved in the assassination and that the murders of his parents were either a cover-up or retaliation. Motive? Silencing potential informants or as a part of a larger conspiracy. Plausibility? Very low. Like others, this theory lacks credible evidence and seems to be more speculative fiction than grounded in actual reality. And number two, extremely low plausibility, of course, is an alien abduction. A fringe theory suggests that Charles Rogers was abducted by aliens, which is why he was never found. This theory is based on the bizarre and inexplicable nature of his disappearance. Motive? None as this theory is purely speculative and based on supernatural explanations. And now some analysis of the investigative challenges. The Icebox Murders case is notorious not only for its gruesome nature, but also for the numerous investigative challenges that have plagued it from the beginning. These obstacles have significantly hindered the progress of solving the perplexing crime, so let's explore the key challenges faced by investigators and their impact on the case. From the moment the bodies were discovered, investigators encountered a series of daunting obstacles. The nature of the crime scene, the lack of immediate suspects, and the intricacies of the case posed significant challenges. Starting off with, you had a gruesome crime scene. The sheer brutality of the dismemberment required investigators to approach the scene with extreme caution. The meticulous manner in which the bodies were disarticulated suggested a perpetrator with specific skills, complicating the profile of the suspect. And of course, the sudden disappearance. The primary suspect, Charles, vanished without a trace. His disappearance meant that investigators had no one to directly question or confront, making it difficult to gather first-hand information. The horrifying nature of the crime drew intense media attention and public scrutiny, adding pressure on law enforcement to solve the case quickly. This often led to rushed decisions and potential oversights. And of course, during this time in the 60s, there was a lack of technological resources. The limitations of the 1960s presented significant barriers to investigation, modern forensics technique, and technologies were not available, leaving investigators with fewer tools at their disposal. We had forensic limitations, DNA analysis, which could have been pivotal in identifying the perpetrator, was not available. Investigators had to rely on more rudimentary methods, such as blood typing and fingerprint analysis. And of course, communication and coordination. The lack of advanced communication technology hindered the co coordination between different law enforcement agencies, and information sharing was slower and less efficient, complicating the search for Charles Rogers and the gathering of evidence. And of course, it was a lot more difficult for crime scene processing in the 60s. Techniques for processing and preserving crime scenes was not advanced or standardized as it is today. This limitation impacted the quality and reliability of the evidence collected. And of course, you also have to face potential mishandling of evidence. The initial handling of the crime scene and the evidence collected has been a point of contention in the investigation. There are several instances where the potential mishandling may have compromised the case. The shocking nature of the discovery led to a high-stress environment, which may have resulted in an inadvertent contamination of the crime scene. Unintentional trampling or mishandling of evidence could have occurred as officers and forensic experts navigated the scene. The methods used to preserve evidence at the time were less sophisticated, potentially leading to the degradation or loss of crucial forensic data. For instance, blood samples and fingerprints may not have been adequately preserved for future analysis. Of course, just like all other cases, you gotta look at the chain of custody. Maintaining a clear and documented chain of custody for evidence is critical. Any lapses in the process could cast doubt on the integrity of the case. 
or integrity of the evidence, excuse me, affecting its inadmissibility and reliability in building a case. The cumulative effect of these challenges has significantly impeded the progress of the Icebox murders investigation. The inability to gather and preserve critical evidence, coupled with the technological procedural limitations of the time, has left many questions unanswered. Despite the initial flurry of activity and investigation, the case quickly went cold. The lack of new leads and the disappearance of the primary suspect have left the case unresolved. The prolonged inability to solve the case has led to frustration and speculation among the public and the victim's families. This frustration has occasionally manifested in criticism of law enforcement's handling of the investigation. Over the years, potential opportunities to solve the case may have been missed due to the initial investigative challenges. Advances in forensic science that could have been applied retrospectively were not possible due to the compromised state of the evidence. The Icebox murders not only left an indelible mark on the victims' families, but also sent shockwaves throughout the entire Houston community. The brutal nature of the crime and the mystery surrounding it had profound effects on the local population. When news of the Icebox murders broke, the Houston community was plunged into a state of shock and disbelief. The gruesome details of the crime quickly spread, creating an atmosphere of fear and uncertainty. The local media extensively covered the case, with headlines and news reports detailing the horrifying discovery. This widespread coverage amplified the community's reaction and brought the case to the forefront of public consciousness. Residents of the Rogers neighborhood were particularly affected. The idea that such a brutal crime could occur in their midst was unsettling, leading to increased vigilance and suspicion among neighbors. The immediate public response was a mixture of horror, fear, and morbid curiosity. People struggled to comprehend how such a violent and calculated act could happen in their city. Many residents were gripped by fear, worried that the perpetrator might still be lurking in the area. This fear was exacerbated by the lack of a clear suspect or motive in the initial uh, stages of the investigation. The community's horror quickly turned to outrage. There was a strong demand for justice and calls for law enforcement to solve the case. Public meetings and discussions reflected the community's desires for answers and assurances of safety. The long-term effects of the icebox murder on the community's sense of safety were profound and endearing. Obviously, there was an erosion of trust. Uh, neighbors became more suspicious of each other, and the sense of community, of community cohesion, was kind of um, starting to be weakened. And of course, in the wake of the murders, there was increased security measures, home security systems, neighborhood watch programs, and self-defense classes saw a surge in popularity as people sought, out, sought to protect themselves and their fear, families. And then, of course, you had a lingering fear. Even years after the murders, the case continued to cast a shadow over the community. The unresolved nature of the crime meant that the fear and uncertainty never fully dissipated, leading a lasting impact on the collective psyche of the neighborhood. And of course, there were some community-led efforts to assist in solving the case. Despite the fear and uncertainty, the community also showed resilience and determination in their efforts to assist in solving the case. Local leaders and concerned citizens made numerous public appeals for information. Flyers, posters, and community meetings were organized to gather any possible leads that could help the investigation. And you had some in vigilante groups. Um, informal vigilante groups are formed with residents taking upon themselves to conduct their own investigation or patrol the neighborhood. While these efforts were well-intentioned, they sometimes complicated official police work. And of course, despite the frustration with the pace of the investigation, many community members supported law enforcement efforts. Fundraisers and events were held to provide additional resources for the police department demonstrating the community's commitment to finding justice for the Rogers. The Icebox murders stand out for the brutality and the mystery surrounding them, but they are not the only case of their kind. Examining other crimes with similarities to the Icebox murders can offer valuable insight and potential connections that might help solve the case. Like we mentioned previously, the Black Dahlia murder uh, Elizabeth Short, known as the Black Dahlia, was found murdered and mutilated in Los Angeles. Her body was bisected at the waist with precise cuts 
ingesting medical knowledge. Both cases involved severe mutilation and the careful dismemberment of the victims, indicating a possible perpetrator with anatomical knowledge. Then, of course, like we mentioned, you have the Jeffrey Dahmer case, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal. He murdered and dismembered 17 young men between 1978 and 1991. He also stored body parts in his apartment, including the refrigerator. So, the similarities with Dahmer, the use of refrigeration to store dismembered body parts, mirrors the method seen in the icebox, icebox murders. Dahmer's case also involved meticulous planning and execution, similar to the icebox murders. And then, which we haven't previously mentioned, the Hinterkaifeck murders from 1922. In Germany, the entire uh, Gruber family was found murdered on their farm, with the bodies hidden and the crime scene showing signs of extensive planning and executions. The murders involved a secluded setting, the presence of a potential perpetrator with intimate knowledge of the victims, and the concealment of the bodies, drawing parallels to the Icebox murders. By examining these and other similar cases, investigators have identified potential patterns and connections that could shed light on the icebox murders. The precision of the dismemberment these cases suggest that the perpetrators likely had some medical or anatomical training. This pattern supports the theory that Charles Rogers, with his scientific background, would be the killer. And like we mentioned, for a motive, you got financial disputes, personal grudges, psychological issues, all similar, or all motives in similar cases. The strained relationship between Charles and his parents fits the pattern. And of course, the use of refrigeration and careful concealment of body parts is a recurring method in dismemberment cases. Understanding this method can provide insights into the mindset and planning of the perpetrator. And now we're going to take a look at the steps to solve the case. The icebox murders have baffled investigators for decades, but there are still steps that can be taken to move the case forward by leveraging modern investigative techniques, enacting potential legal changes, and encouraging public involvement. We can bring new hope to solving this long-standing mystery. To, investi to advance the investigation, it's crucial to revisit and re-examine every aspect of the case every aspect of the case with fresh eyes and updated resources. This includes reviewing case files, engaging cold case experts, and revisiting witnesses. And of course, the advancement of forensic uh, science and technology offers powerful tools to help, help crack the case. You got DNA profiling, digital reconstruction, allowing um, you to create a Reconstruction of the crime scene to better understand the sequence of events and potentially identify overlooked evidence. And then now, in the 2000s, we have advanced fingerprint analysis. And of course, widely used is behavioral profiling. Legal and policy changes can also play a crucial role in advancing the investigation. There's been, over the years, cold case legislation that prioritizes and funds cold cases, improved evidence handling, and cross-jurisdiction collaboration. Of course, public engagement is vital for uncovering new leads and keeping the investigation active. There's been public appeals, um, offering rewards, community outreach. Viewers and the general public can play a significant role in solving the icebox murders by sharing information, staying informed, and supporting advocacy efforts. So finally, we've covered the gruesome details of the Icebox murders, explored the victim's background, delved into the discovery of the crime scene, examined evidence that was found, took a look at the primary suspect, and discussed, discussed various theories and speculations. We also highlighted the significant challenges investigators faced the impact on the local community. Additionally, we looked at recent developments, similar cases, and steps that could be taken to move the case forward. Solving the Icebox murders is not just about unraveling a mystery, it's about bringing justice to Fred and Edwin Rogers and providing closure for their family and the community. The brutality of the crime and the unanswered questions have left a lasting scar. 
By solving this case, we honor the victims and restore a sense of justice and safety to the community. We need your help to keep the momentum going. Stay informed about the latest developments in the case and continue to share information within your networks. If you have any theories, no matter how strange or unusual they are, leave, leave them in the comments. If you found this video informative and compelling, please like and subscribe to our channel. Your support helps us to continue to bring you in-depth investigations into solved and unsolved crimes. Share the video with your friends and family to spread awareness about the murders, and together we can keep the case in the public eye and push for justice for the justice Fred and Edwin Rogers deserves. Thank you for joining us on this journey into one of Houston's most gruesome unsolved crimes. Stay tuned for more true crime stories and updates. And of course, if you want to support the channel even more, you can buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash TCNS. Your support helps the channel grow, upgrade our equipment, bring in new hosts, be able to pay them, and one day take this show on the road. And with your support, we can make all that happen po possible. And of course, whether you can share a dollar, five dollars, twenty, fifty, hundred, no matter what you can give, it's all appreciated. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to your podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms, and you can find us on Good Pods. And with that, thank you so much for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.